I think the first thing I want to say is to really congratulate the Workers' Party on producing a policy document on a secular future, because too often on the left there's a lot of sloganeering, there's a lot of rah-rah, but the actual in-depth analysis that needs to go on to support the proposition that's been put forward isn't often there enough, and I think particularly now at the juncture that we're at, <coughs> post the Eighth Amendment, um, the whole context really of the battles that have been fought over the past period and the opportunity now, probably unrivaled in many instances, of us actually having a chance to really move forward in terms of separating church and state. And that's not in any way to downplay that, to think that it's easy or that it's just a case of unfurling a banner and that that will just happen. But I think in terms of the hearts and minds of the populace, Never before have we been in a time like we are now, where people desire to live in an Ireland of equals. And it's not just because of the influx of people from different religions, it's also because we've moved on. I mean, I, I made the point before, I would have been involved very much in setting up the Educate Together school for my daughter, who's now in, in college, years ago. Uh, because I'm an atheist and I didn't want to you know have to deal with sort of religion all the time or religious indoctrination but actually ended up nearly dealing with multiple religions as a result of that by having not only do we have to deal with Catholicism but we have every religion under the sun every single day except the idea of no religion and uh, I actually think when we talk about secularism uh, that a key part of that is that absolutely religious freedoms whatever you're having yourself, but that's over there. That's your business. That should never be a part of any institutions of the state. And I think that's a key plank, and I really salute the Workers' Party for the work done on the, the policy document uh, that we have before us today. I think over the past period, there has been a lot of discussions about how and why did religious um, institutions get so much power and control over people in Irish society and why have they never really been subjected to the law of the land, particularly when it comes to profoundly important issues like say um, the protection of children in their care and I think we have to acknowledge in the debate the role of some of the victims in this situation who have come forward and who have really served to change the narrative over the past period. I mean we see it very much in the survivors of industrial abuse but we also saw it recently in uh, people who've had abortions in Ireland, in the parents, in the terminations for medical reasons, all of the women who came forward and told their stories and so on. They began to, I suppose, open an insight into real life in Ireland. We obviously, over the whole past decades, I suppose, saw a lot of, of powerful memoirs. We saw lots of stories about uh, industrial abuse, uh, fear of the collar, stolen lives. We had recently Paul Redmond's book on the adoption machine, movies like the Magdalena Sisters, Philomena and so on, which did serve to educate people about the role of uh, religious institutions in Ireland. And it was, I suppose, hard to ignore um, and hard to not have a sense of outrage at the crimes that were done by the religious establishment to people in uh, Irish society, but suppose one of the things that, that has been undermined has been, I will call it, the perceived power of the Catholic Church, because and when I say that, what I really mean is, I suppose, their hold over the hearts and minds of ordinary people. That is something that has been gone. It's clearly gone in the last two referendums, and whatever. but there's, a, a, I suppose, a, a divorcing between that on the one hand and the control that they still maintain over organisations of the state. And it's probably not even something that people are wholly conscious of, which is a bit shocking in some ways, because most people, I think, are tolerant. They do believe that, you know, whatever religious views people have is a, is a private matter, that the state funded by the taxpayer should be available uh, to all on the basis of, of need and human rights and so on. So I do think on the one hand we have a contradiction. They've lost the battle for the hearts and minds, but they still keep the stranglehold over education and health in particular and key organisations of the state. And Mary said to me at the start, and I'm going to leave 
you to kick Simon Harris. I go, I'm trash, because that actually wasn't in the script at all. I wasn't even going to bother doing that, because I kind of figured that most he would kind of be already clued in to knowing what the neoliberal agenda is in Ireland, like that it's very much the public face that we live in a tolerant, diverse Ireland with, a, you know, uh, all, all of that good stuff, but actually the reality for ordinary people hasn't changed at all, and it hasn't changed either in terms of the liberal agenda, either. No, it, obviously, critically, it hasn't changed economically uh, either. But I do think that the last time we discussed this here, I suppose the Eighth Amendment was still in place, um, and you know I think we have moved on a lot. We can look at this two ways. You can look at it as kind of the glass half empty or half full. Um, the church has a considerable control over the levers of power in Ireland, but at the same time, we've traveled a, an incredibly uh, long road in quite a short period over the past time. In the wider historical sense, if you like, it's only been a few decades since uh, John Charles McCabe Quaid had the year of government ministers and could bury them. People like Jack Murphy, the unemployed TD was pushed out of office from bullying from the church. Noel Brown lost his position. These things now we hear would never happen, and yet they control um, many um, organisations of the state. And that's why I think the document produced by the Workers' Party is an important one because what I like about it is that it, the kind of step change approach instead of being impractical about it. Because when you glance at some of the details of the level of patronage, uh, and the structure of school boards and hospital boards, the issues that Mary touched on, the role of trust, you can see actually how unravelling it is actually quite complex. It's not really that straightforward or easy to do. I think the fact that only 10 schools have divested so far testifies to this reality. And I think we do have to win over people in one way as to why secularism is important. We do have to win that battle. Uh, with people, but at the same time we have to put it into place um, practically. Uh, I suppose there is a debate to be had. Some people would say that on the left sometimes we overestimate uh, religious power, uh, but others could say actually we underestimate it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, where the truth probably lies somewhere in between. I mean, it is the case that we're not unique uh, in Ireland, that um, if you like, the, the Catholic Church's relationship with the state does go back to independence. It was linking religion to national independence that allowed them to reinforce the ideology on people's lives. But we're not unique in that. I mean, if you look at other European countries, Poland has a similar preamble to its constitution that we have. The French give, actually, ironically, give a special place to Catholicism in Britain. Uh, to this day, you can only be a member of, of, only a member of the Church of England can become Prime Minister. We know the United States, not that we be basing ourselves on them, but have, in God we trust, on their currency. So even countries that we think are secular and modern actually do pay a lot of lip service and homage to uh, religion. But I, I, I do think in Ireland, the shift has been that while people, I, you know, on paper identify as Catholic, and obviously it's absolutely correct to put the emphasis on the fact that in the last census, although the figure showed at 78%, that's the, the lowest level that we've had. And when you delve into it, it's actually incredibly superficial that people sign up to the paraphernalia, they love the First Communion and the weddings and all that good ceremony stuff, but actually, in terms of the content of Catholic teaching, their hearts and minds haven't been uh, won over in that. But at the same time, I do think probably the critical part of this is to look at uh, the work to achieve a secular state. I suppose it's not impossible because of that, on the one hand. Um, you know, when we look at, um, I suppose, it's hard to, um, well, I, I don't want to raw points or out of the document, which were very well made. Um, when we look at them, <laughs> they're so good. I said, I don't want to raw Hamish's points because they were really uh, well prepared in that, I suppose. But, you know, when we, and I, and I won't do it because, you know, in fairness, that's where the work was done. But, I mean, I think we need to put, I suppose, a positive spin on this. We can look at it two ways. The task we have before us is difficult, but we have never had 
and more fertile terrain than we have now in terms of the willingness of people to capitalise on that. So how do we practically untangle that? I think Mary has done that in terms of the health service, but we also need to look at that now in terms of schooling. We've had two uh, key referenda over the past period. We actually have a referendum coming up now on blasphemy. Nobody probably even knows it's on. We're supposed to have a discussion on the role of women in the family and all of that good stuff. But actually what that is, is it's a dressing up of the constitution to masquerade behind uh, uh, an illusion of liberalism without really dealing with the crucial issues that we need a new constitution and a new Ireland to look at these things differently. And uh, I do think that um, you know, curtailing structural power inside public services has to be a key in that. There's no doubt about it, but the, the debates around the abortion legislation, which are going on in the Dáil tonight, already we're getting bombarded every day around the issues of conscientious objection and so on. We know that five of the 19 maternity hospitals are, if you like, kicking, or staff in them are kicking to not implement the new legislation. How could that possibly be the case in a system whereby the health service is funded entirely by the taxpayer? Absolutely not on. And we have a similar situation in our schools, which I'm not going to rob the points from Ailish in that regard. So, I mean, look at, I mean, I haven't dealt with anything in any detail, and I'm conscious of that, but I didn't, I, I'm appreciative, I suppose, for the fact that the Workers' Party have convened tonight and facilitated the discussion because the discussion begins in the sense of the hearts and minds and then we need to take it in to the parliament there's a lot of legislation tabled in terms of the schools and the hospital but it's a case of mobilizing people to go out to try and push the politicians to deliver because that's certainly what the people want but on this issue like so many others there's such a gulf between the two so i'm just here really to to lend my support to that like you know. so,